Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen. I am very proud, very, very proud to present, to present the award for best actor in a leading role in 2024. For cinematography. For best original screenplay. Best director. Your class of 2028 valedictorian. Class of 2032 Phi Beta Kappa initiate. Graduating cum laude. Your next president. Put your hands together for our newest partner. Journalist. Poet. James Beard award-winning chef. Introducing Supreme Court Justice. Distinguished Fulbright Scholar. 2027 Nobel Prize candidate. The Honorable. Acclaimed. World-renowned. Award for Lifetime Achievement goes to. If we believe in their futures, they will believe in them too. I am my I brother's keeper. I am keeper. my brother's keeper.
I'll try to be loud enough so I want to really hard this one. Okay. First, I'd like to just thank you for having us here today uh, to talk about my brother's keeper, which is, I know, a very important issue uh, that has been started, but it has to continue. It has to have momentum. First of all, the rules of the game. This program is interactive, which means, which means, I'm, oh, I'm, I forgot to tell you, I'm hard of hearing, so you got it. So, being interactive, what does it mean? Participation. 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 We need the participation. Um, we have some outstanding young men here, and before that, I like history. I like history. So, I need you to help me because they, they told me there are some very intelligent people here. My brother's keeper. What, did that, what does that mean? Where did it come from? Where did it come from? The Bible. Who said that? Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should have known. <laughs> of hearing Cain and Abel. What about Cain and Abel? What about it? Quickly, if you check in Genesis, I think it's around the ninth, uh, ninth verse. Uh, God had come on the scene. Remember, um, who was the first man? Adam. Adam, Adam, yeah. Adam. And uh, from Adam came, came a woman, the name of Eve. They had sons. The sons name were Cain and Abel. Cain was kind of a, like an outdoorsy, big rough kind of guy, you know, real tough, well. Um, Abel, a little more gentle, more intelligent, uh, required a good guy. Cain was always very jealous, always jealous of Abel. And one day he was so jealous, he decided to kill him. So God came on the scene and asked, where's Abel? And Cain answered, Am I my brother's keeper? Do you think that's what President Obama had in mind when he came up with the idea of my brother's keeper? No. <laughs> what was his intent? Intent. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> intent. I don't know if you tell your brother, <laughs> To provide help and mentor, joy, and support. We when are our brother's keepers. We are. And it's important that we take care of each other, help each other. And I think the young men who are here today are going to share some of that with you. Now, I was supposed to ask you a very important question about your role with the mentorship and what have you. But what I think I want to know first, and take about 30 seconds, um, who are you? Tell, tell me where you came from, because I know you didn't come from mother's womb dressed the way you are right now. <laughs> so, so uh, this is TJ. Good morning, uh, my name is TJ Clark II, I'm from Hartford, Connecticut, and I'm currently the president of the Hartford City Council. But where'd you yes. come from, though? My mother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Um, I was uh, born in Hartford and raised between Hartford and Bloomfield, and I was educated through the Bloomfield Public School System. Okay, all right, all right. Um, Mr. King, okay. tell me something about you. Yeah, I can. can you hear me without the mic? No. Please oh. use the microphone. Can you hear me better than that? Okay. So I grew up in New York City. I'm a Bronx boy. Uh, I had the fortune of uh, growing up uh, in New York City. And I was what we call, uh, with me and my partner, the Legacy Foundation, call ourselves the SOTs, Sons of Teachers. Uh, so we have a profound admiration for what needs to be done in education. Uh, once again, I mentioned I grew up in the Bronx. Uh, Got educated at a uh, private school in Virginia and uh, then went to the University of Detroit and came back home and uh, got a master's degree at Manhattan College in New York. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Poor. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little something about you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Douglas McCorry. I was born and raised and still live in the North City of Hartford, educated in the city of Hartford. Uh, eventually went on to the University of Hartford. Thank you. 
Not Kurt Peters. Who else? Kurt Peters. I was uh, also born in the Bronx. I lived there for about a month. I was uh, <laughs> <laughs> out there. Boston Road in the Bronx. But uh, my dad lived there and my mom their entire lives. And my dad went into the service. So I'm an Air Force brat. Lived all around the country and lived in Europe for three years. And so I'm a product of the armed service. I've been here for uh, 16 years. I'm very proud to be a dean and to service our students. And this is Santiago, a friend of mine. All right, good morning. My name is Andre Santiago. I'm a senior program director of Leadership Career at Hartford. Uh, I was born in Hartford, grew up in East Hartford, now back in Hartford. Uh, like Mr. Saunders, I'm a music teacher by training. Um, but Spending a lot of my time in Hartford, I realized that I needed to come back uh, and continue the work that I was doing through the leadership at Hartford. It's a privilege to be here today. Thank you. Mr. Shaw. Uh, my name is Darwin Shaw, and I'm uh, from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, I came to New Britain, Connecticut. When my mother passed away when I was nine years old. Uh, she passed away at 26 and had four kids at that time. By the time she was 18, and I was raised by a host of family uh, and a lot of support from from neighbors and coaches along the way. Uh, I currently teach at New Britain High School where I see many of my former students and, and some athletes. Um, I've been there for 32 years. I coach uh, boys basketball, junior varsity, and I'm the head girls track coach. Uh, and if you need further information about me, I wrote a book about my life coming up without parents and how to become successful with the help of many others. And in the back table, you'll see uh, I have some information about my book. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. <laughs> and I should tell you, they gave up a lot of their personal time to be here, so we really appreciate that. If you remember, there was a video that happened earlier. Do you remember the video? Mm -hmm. What did you see? What did you see? Little boy. Here they are. Here they are. This is what they can be. But none of these little boys would have been here today if there weren't someone, if there wasn't probably a mentor. So what is a mentor? That's the question because I don't know. What's a mentor? Gentlemen, help me out. A mentor. Mentor. What is a mentor? I got a little problem with the word mentor. Okay. Sometimes that um, I prefer the word sponsor. Okay. The reason why I say that because I believe that a mentor is good, but a sponsor makes things happen. And we need to have, it's nice to have mentors, yeah. but it's better to have a sponsor. Okay. Because that sponsor is going to open the door. A mentor may, to me, uh, be a guidance counselor in a relationship. And that's good, you need those. But you really need a sponsor, somebody that's going to execute and make it happen. That's my turn. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned that because when I thought about what a mentor, I also don't buy to the traditional term of a mentor. I think a sponsor also an investor. Uh, a mentor is an investor, someone who's going to invest in you because they want to see the payoff somewhere down the line. And they're going to put everything they have to trust in you, build in you, study you, provide for you, to make sure you become successful, just like investors do with their stocks and money. So I think a mentor is an investor, someone who's going to invest in a child's life. Excellent, thank you. I appreciate the word investor. I, I, I happen to like mentor, I think, uh, for me, it's one who leads by example. It's not just their words, but it's their actions. And uh, for me, growing up in different places, I didn't have, the only person I had, and the most important person I had, was my dad and my mom. They were my mentors, they were my leaders, and they didn't formally sit me down and teach me life's lessons, but they, but by their example. And uh, that, to me, is what uh, I've tried to do with my own children. No, I think no matter what you call it, it's about a relationship. And so it's, it's me bringing my values to the table, um, giving you opportunities to learn what your values are and how you can uh, reflect those values in all that you do in life. Um, but most importantly, caring for you. I 
think a lot of times we get caught up in the business of life and growing up and we forget that we're all humans and we all need that connection and that relationship. So whatever you call it, uh, it's, it's all about the heart. And I think, you know, I teach leadership, but the concept of leadership has changed over the years. It was about top-down leaders, and now it's about the relationship, the connection, the, the providing the care for people to grow and develop in whatever capacity they need They need that care. Well, when you grow up without parents after the age of nine, you need a whole lot of people in your life to put you in a position to be successful. So I simply call mine help. And it's one of the chapters in my book, and it stands for H is for someone to hear me, someone to encourage me, someone to love me, and someone to prepare me for the different things that are going to take place throughout my life. I've been fortunate and blessed to follow so many people that put me in that direction, and now I'm in a position to help others through my own story. So simply to me, it's help. sentiments of uh, my colleagues here on the panel, I do believe a mentor uh, is somebody that actually cares, deeply cares, and when I think about mentors, I think about uh, my father, uh, who I would say mentored me, and people, as, as well as my mother, uh, and people who would invest their time um, to raise me, to nurture me, to educate me, uh, as you had said regarding the video, uh, those were young boys and look at us now, so that's what a mentor is, really, is somebody that sticks with you um, through the good times and the bad times, and uh, no matter what disappointments may come about, uh, they never leave your side. So do you kind of understand what mentoring is all about? Just a rough idea. Uh, if we wanted to talk about mentoring programs, or programs, uh, any programs that you've been involved in, just to give us an idea, and the kinds of things you do in that program, that would be helpful. And uh, yourself, Mr. Shaw? Uh, I, I do so many things as, a, as an ed educator. Um, I'm involved with, with a lot of things, but one thing that I try to do that, that I give back is I, I run this big basketball tournament uh, called the Osgood Shootout, which is held at New Britain High School. Excuse me, Mr. Shaw. I just wanted to remind you, this is interactive, so when you, when you have questions, and you will have questions, don't hold them, ask them. I'm sorry, go ahead and answer. Uh, I forgot where I was at. Oh, he was talking about the basketball tournament. Um, <laughs> since I'm in, involved with sports, I, I wanted to come back because so many people helped me out along the way. And I was fortunate to go to Kentucky State University as a walk-on, uh, as a track athlete. And I ended up becoming a two-time All-American. And I wanted to return and give some people the same opportunity. So what I do is I run this big basketball tournament called the Osgood Shootout. Uh, it's been running since 1992. Uh, I've given out 57 scholarships. We try to give out $500 scholarships to every, every year. Uh, last year we were fortunate to give out four scholarships. Uh, that's one way that I like to give back and, and it's with young kids that work and help out in the community and they have a positive direction about what they want to do with their life. One stipulation is when you go away, I need you to come back to give back. And since I was fortunate, that's one avenue that I use to give back to others. Okay. Okay. Next, all right, switching up the order. Uh, so I think uh, in, in the many programs that I direct with Leadership of Hartford, uh, connecting my students to professionals from throughout throughout the region in whatever sector or field that, that they are in uh, to build that relationship to connect um, and inspire our young men to to continue to grow and develop. So uh, a lot through the programs that I offer, but in addition to that, I serve on a few boards of directors for organizations uh, pertaining to the arts and, and other uh, sports related uh, types of organizations. So I think. Programmatically, but also serving back on nonprofit boards of directors. We, uh, as a Hartford region, have a tremendous uh, array of wonderful nonprofit organizations that are out there that are providing great work. Um, I happen to work right next door to that Make Their Brothers Big Sisters, which is a wonderful uh, mentoring program that connects students, uh, young men and young women, to, to older big brothers or big sisters. I see a question back there. Question, yes. So, 
gentlemen um, you all look very nice in your suits and ties and everything but what advice would you give to just the lay person who wanted to make a difference and mentor a young man um, who isn't involved in an organization that there's no organization to connect them to that it's it's the young man on the street that you see but every single day on the street you still know the same thing and you want to reach out what kind of advice would you give to one of us even as students um, you know, what could a student do to reach out and connect with a young man? I think you have to connect them with somebody that has uh, the resources to help them um, and somebody that can relate to them. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, in my capacity, uh, I co-chair the Public Safety and Quality of Life uh, Committee on the City Council. Uh, so I have been um, very concerned about the uh, mental health uh, capacity of a lot of our young men uh, in the city as well as the public safety issue. So um, one of uh, advice that was given to me uh, was to uh, get to the, in order to tackle some of the issues is get to the quote unquote knuckleheads um, because everybody is not going to be in the room. Um, so uh, I follow up on that and work with a couple of people that are deeply in the street and to get a get a hold of two of the knuckleheads and uh, was able to break down the barrier to see exactly what they needed. Uh, and it's a work in progress, but if you can just break that mold to figure out exactly what they need and connect them with somebody that actually can provide those resources, because a lot of them have broken hearts, you know, people have failed them over the course of time, and they don't really expect anybody to help out. But again, connecting them with somebody that can relate to them and, and can deliver on a promise. If you can deliver on one promise, and you're opening up that uh, that door to help them even further. I think that connection is important. I had um, I was a big brother to two young men, little guys. One was a, from a program through Trinity. It worked well, Trinity College. He was a Latino and East Indian boy, and I'm about one third East Indian. Uh, back then, I had hair. I had hair like him, and we connected. It was just a year program. And I was able to make those connections, and I think I was able to mentor him. He moved on, I stayed in touch for a while, but then we lost touch. The second person through, the second little one through, not um, make big brothers, I was not successful. I was not mature enough. I was 30 years old and thought I could do anything with anyone, and I asked the big brothers person, just give me the most difficult person. And I think at that point it was about me trying to be really a good heart. And I couldn't connect with this young person who was a very troubled seven-year-old boy. And I did some things, we had some fun, but I realized I never made the connection. So I, I think it's, it's, it's easier, it's easy to say you can go out there and make a difference to everybody, but that's a tall order. And I think we have to be careful. And at that time, I was not mature enough to make, to, to have the kind of relationship I wanted to. I would think now I could reach out to a lot, you know, but now I'm 60 and I've had the experience and I think I could do that, but then I could not. And um, that relationship ended after one year and uh, it's not something I'm really proud of. I, I, did, I did well, I probably did as much as I could, but the connections as you stated are very important. I have a question, thanks for bringing that up, because yeah. everybody can't be a mentor. There's a specific right. factor here, throw it out there. Because again, there's a commitment that, that needs to be established. Can we, the panel, share with us what your resume needs to look like to really make an impact in young people's lives? You really want to take on this task of mentorship? What type of resume as you, as a person, need to bring to the table to make a difference in young people's lives? Uh, to me, you just have to simply have a, have to have a heart of love. Uh, going back to the young lady in the back who, who asked what, what is something that you can do and to, to echo your um, question also, I was in that position like a lot of, lot of the young kids growing up and, and being a school teacher for 32 years at New Britain High School, I see things daily. I, I sense things that people need and I simply just share my story for that person that no one else can reach and you kind of simply share your own story and then they don't believe what, what happened to your life and then once you share it, 
It gives them some hope of how something can change around in their life. Because a lot of the kids today, especially the inner city kids, are dealing with households where they're coming from just the mother, where there's never been a father figure in their life. So when Coach Shaw says, how did he get through all of these, these barriers, I just simply share my story and tell them that there's a whole bunch of people out there that can help you. You just got to seek those people out. And if not, they're going to find a way to seek you out. But you have to be in a situation where they hear you. Some of the young kids today hear, but they, they really don't hear because all they're doing is listening. So they can listen, but they, do they really hear what you're talking about? And once they come back to you, you know that you're getting to a point where you're trying to uh, get inside of your head and tell them about the good things that happen. Uh, I, I'm going a little away from it, but this young man right here, we grew, we grew up fifth grade. He's a uh, chief of police at Central Connecticut State University. And he shares those same stories. And when I see him around some people and they say, do you know Captain Steve? And I say, he's not the captain no more, he's the chief. And they said, no, and he's, I said, no, because he went from one step to the next step to the next step. How did he get there? Find him and talk to him. And our kids some, sometimes simply just don't want to open up. But once you get them to open up a little bit, that's your angle to go and try to get more from them. And then they trust you, and then they'll do almost anything for you. And you get in a situation where you can try to get them out of the situation that they're in. But you got to have a heart of love to do that. can't be about you. I just want to, uh, I think one of the questions were earlier, you said, but what, what have you done to be a mentor? So in my career as an educator, after about five, six years in an elementary school system, I got a call from one of my mentors. And he said that, hey, you know, I'm in the middle school and I see a lot of our young brothers. They're here physically, but mentally they're not here. They're just going through motions. So what him and I did, we created an all-boys school, all-male school, taught by all-male teachers in the city of Hartford, North End same kids that you hear and read about every day. And what we did for six years, we had the high, most highly educated young men in the state of Connecticut for six consecutive years. It was called the Benjamin E. Mays Institute. It was named after Dr. Martin Luther King mentor. And we taught them not just math, science, social study, and reading, but we made it cultural. And we made it with an impact on African-American history and culture. And we had our young men eating out of our palm of our hands. We had men going over to Duke University. I got doctors right now to call on. We made such an impact in our kids' lives that we see them every single day. And just last week, I saw one of my students. He said to me, you know, in seventh, eighth grade, you guys called us at the right time. Because that's the point in their lives where they want to go on to high school, but they're going to be serious about getting an education or falling off. So for what we did, it was the greatest experience I ever had. We taught them uh, rights to patches program. They were doing the arts. They were doing all the things you hear about they want to do nowadays that they don't have. And can you imagine a kid dealing with me and four other black men for two consecutive years every single day? We know how to educate our children. We know what they need. Systematically, the question becomes, what we want to do as a system? Because we know what works. And are we willing to put the political capital of line and do what it takes to make our young men successful? The blueprint has already been out there. It's just a matter of leadership. Leadership among us, everyone in a position of power to make sure we do what needs to be done for our young people to be successful. It's not nothing new. We've been in this country all our lives. We've made it this far. We can do it again. Sir, I think that was an excellent question, and I just think that one of the big things for me was consistency. That I knew that there was this person, or these persons, who would always be there when I need them. Um, what helped me, I think, in high and middle school when I taught, uh, was that I was always there. I tried to always be there. Um, I worked in the village center with where most of my students came from. It's the section of Middletown. And they cornrowed my hair when I had hair and I couldn't get it out. But they knew I'd be there. They knew I'd be there. They knew I went uh, and I received further education, not from me, but because I wanted to be exposed to more of them, to more of them. And I think for the 42 years I've been there, uh, it's kind of like an anchor that they know that if, if all else fails, 
I can go back to the rock. And there's some stability, there's some consistency that happens to me. But you, somebody, I think, you bring a very good question. Um, that's one of the questions I was going to ask. Do you have to be a man of color to mentor younger men of color? And before you answer, I'm going to go to professionals. You don't mind me. Okay, good. Do you have to be a man of color in order to mentor to young men of color? Yes, no, and why? Or what? Yes, ma'am, thank you. I because say, I was going to stay here all day. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I would say no, but I think that there are um, advantages to being a man of color if you're mentoring a younger man of color, and that's the connection piece. Um, but I think there are other ways to connect. So as long as there's some connection there, then maybe you're able to make a difference. OK. Yes, ma'am. I say no because, well, sometimes it helps, but I will tell a, a personal story. I taught several semesters at the uh, Cheshire in, at Manson, the youth correctional facility at Manson, Connecticut. And the first uh, class I taught there, there were probably 15 students, most of whom were um, men of color. But there were several in particular who took, a, who took an interest in what was going on in the classroom without even knowing it. The first thing I ever did the first night I walked in there was to take the body alarm that I was given to wear just in case something were to go wrong. I put it on the table behind me. And I found out later that that indicated to them that I trusted them enough to not wear that body alarm. And so that opened up their feelings about me. And we were able to then communicate for the rest of the semester. But there were several students in that class, one of whom I am very, very proud of and am in touch with to this day, who left Manson, went on to get his baccalaureate degree at Western Connecticut State University. He went on from there to NYU, New York City. He now has two master's degrees. He has worked for in South Africa. He was in Johannesburg for a while. He uh, works for Black Entertainment Television now. We are still in touch. He's from Plainville. We're still in touch, and I believe that I, I, I believe that he was not only ready to hear what I was doing, but I was ready to give some energy to him and help support him along the way. So my personal experience is, no, you don't have to be a man of color to be a mentor. You have to care and open your heart and be in the right place at the right time. So, yes, sir. Culturally, it's important to have African-American role models for young African. Is it necessary? That's the question. Mm -hmm. No, it's not necessary. I go back to the reason, part of the reason I sit there, obviously, my congregation, how you're raised, and the morals and values that are, that are imposed upon you during that foundation period. But the reason that I sit here today is because of a white man who found something in me and pointed me toward law enforcement, who mentored me through my initial phases of law enforcement. He saw something and mentored me during that phase. Now, subsequent, subsequently, the African American male took me and continued that journey and got me to this point. But the initial conception of this desire, this, this field, came from a white man who mentored me, took me, guided me through the process, got me going, helped me through the testing process, and taught me how to do this job the right way. So it depends on what you're talking about as far as mentoring. There's so many different ways that we've got to discuss up there, but there is no, and, and the this question here, the resume. The resume is, as Darwin said, you need to love in your heart to do it. That's the resume. You don't need a doctorate degree. You don't need to have a master's degree. You have a bachelor's degree. You 
and I echo, I said no, but again, it, it, it touched a deep, it touched on something deeper. Then uh, the question is, where are the men of color at to step up and, and to lead our young men of color? So I think it's no, you don't need it, but it, then it goes to another question. If, 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 a, if a white man, somebody else could do it, then wh where are we at? I'm not speaking, I'm taking it personal now. Mm -hmm. Where am I at yeah. that I can do the same? Somebody else has to step in. It's not my child, but somebody has to step in and lead that person. And so I don't think it, it doesn't matter, but it goes to a deeper question is, if where, where, where are the men of color at? Where's their commitment? And so the thing is, is that, uh, like the echo, so it doesn't matter somebody who has that resume, has that found a solid background and foundation that can help lead our young men to where they need to be. I'd just like to get a comment from the, uh, <coughs> from another one of my experts in the rear. Yes, sir. standpoint, from the experience standpoint, from just the relationship standpoint, that is the ideal situation, just like it is for other groups, right? Anybody can mention other groups of people, but if you ask them who would they prefer, any, any other group would say, I would prefer someone who is just like me. So I think that that's the same answer when it comes to men of color. The, the challenge has been is that, like the gentleman said, we haven't been present in many cases, so we have to rely on other groups of people. When other groups of people have that relationship already in place. So I think that ideally, yes, it does make a difference when you see someone who looks like you, experiences the same things you've experienced, um, and that, that helps. Now, to say that also, just because you are African American or a man of color doesn't mean that you do have that same experience, because we are diverse too, right? So it's not that, Oh, every black person can relate to every black person who comes from the hood. No, we have different experiences, but whatever, you, wherever you come from, there is that necessity to have that connection, to build that relationship, and to know that they can trust you, to know that they can um, can look to you, and that you're not going to leave them like so many other people have. So I think that's that's the key: is to is, is to be there for for them consistently, um, but also ideally when you have that that initial connection. Thank you, Thank you. Yes, so I run a, a mentoring program from Queen Bird Family Center, and I have to say that while I agree with everything you said, I've seen successes from both sides. I've seen successes with a white man and a young man of color, and I've seen fails on, on with both sides too. So I think really what it comes down to is where is your heart and what are you willing to give? You know, and I agree, I think that when boys are color need to see men of color and because they're missing that component in their communities. Um, but I, I do think mentoring can work both ways. I know you I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I just want to add, I, I agree with absolutely what Brother X. I think ideally the situation of young men of color. Because this is some things that I know I can communicate to a young person of color that Although you might be a great mentor, you're not going to be able to get across the way I need to get across. Or I can say it a certain way. I can reference certain things a certain way to make a child understand. But I also believe that it depends on where that where that person is in their life. Because, like what you said, you know, this is reality. I mean, there's some things, some barriers I'm not going to be able to break, break through as a black man in this society, and I'm going to need somebody else that don't look like me to help that person mentor them 
in that role as an opportunity, maybe opportunity for employment. There's some things I can't do for that person of color. But as a young boy coming up, I think ideally they need a young man of color showing them the way. But it gets to a point where I might have to pass that person on to the next person like you, or the next person like you, because now I don't need everything I can possibly do. But if he's trying to become that CEO, I I can't do that for him. Because I can't be I can't be what I don't see. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I think it is. Ideally at the beginning stages to give him that child that foundation, to teach him how to uh, you know, code switch. The things you do, how to dress properly, and when, when you can dress like, be yourself, and be all those things, you can't do that for that child. But I can take them to a certain point, and then I'll let you put them in your hands. I think it's crucial. I, I, for people who know me are probably surprised that I'm saying this, but I just think one step below absolutely essential to have people of color mentor people of color. I grew up in a white world. I grew up where I was the only black kid in for 16 years of my life for the most part, and I always felt alone. I had my parents who I loved, but I didn't have anyone. I, I was successful, I was a leader, probably because of athletics, but I felt very alone. Um, I didn't have the typical black experience. I was not white, so I was, I had, I needed a person of color outside. I looked at people like, Muhammad Ali was my first idol. Bill Russell, Arthur Ashe, but I didn't know these men, they weren't in my community. And I tell my kids, growing up, and maybe I think too much of myself, but I want to be their role model, I want to be their mentor, and not just look up to stars like I did, but the one person that I tell them, I like them to listen to every single word he says, was President Obama. And to me, if I had I, I, I read books that I saw, like the Dick and Jane books, I saw the police officers, they were all white. I grew up, the only person I knew on TV was, was a, um, a comedian maybe. I didn't see the astronaut, I didn't see the politician. I saw Dr. King, yes. But I didn't know anyone, I had no one in my community. So yes, I think I could mentor anyone, but to truly make those connections, we need people of color, mentoring other people of color. And, and that doesn't mean I can mentor all children of color because I was unsuccessful dealing with a person from the hood, because that's not where I'm from. But there are people out there, but I think the most important mentor, you, the most important relationship you can have is with your kids. And I think when I became a dad, and I've, I've been a single dad for 10 years, and I've taken these kids by myself, I've had like four nights alone in the last 10 years. There, there's always been a kid with me. That's my responsibility. Because I think I can impart something. And I wish there were more. There are a lot of people out there, but um, it, it's, I, I, I think, it, yes, you can mentor other people, but it's, it's, it's almost essential that men of color serve as mentors. So I missed out on a lot. My father was not around, and so I, I missed out on a lot growing up about the Puerto Rican culture and, 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 and things of that nature. So yes, I would have, uh, it would have helped me in my journey had I had positive male role models uh, from, from my family or the community. Um, but I think, you know, I learned a lot from my students. I think that's why I love teaching. One of my students said last week, you don't have to have just one mentor. He said he, he thinks of his mentors as his board of directors. And what makes a great board of directors is having people from all walks of life, all different fields, all different religions, uh, there to give him guidance along his journey. And so that really uh, spoke, spoke true to me. And I think about Hartford, and Hartford's such a unique place because you see people like TJ and myself and other, other people, we're all kind of sharing the talent of the, the young men in the community. We're all, we all know the same young men. We all uh, inspire them in our own ways, and I think that's really what what would have helped me growing up. It's not just one person. I had, I had uh, my own little board of directors and it would have helped me if, if, if some of my friends uh, did the same. So don't, I, don't, I don't think of mentorship as a, as a one person relationship because I think why mentorships fail is because life happens. So the mentor gets sick or travels or something goes on in their own life and they lose that connection. And so what better way to strengthen that than having more than one? One more question I was just wondering. Uh, for the mentor that you had, or the, mentor, or the sponsor that you had, or 
parents in your life that you had, what was the one thing that you wished they had shared with you? A blueprint. <laughs> it's not a blueprint on life, a blueprint on exactly uh, the challenges as a uh, young man of color that we're going to experience, uh, the blueprint of the institutional racism um, that would exist and that presently still exists, um, and the barriers that actually um, present to you, as Doug was saying, uh, there's a ceiling. And uh, as a, a man of color, you know, there are certain ceilings that are placed over us uh, that people dare us to break. And uh, I think the best way to uh, describe it is, you know, still as, it, as, what, as what society presents us, is that uh, we still have to work twice as hard um, to achieve the same outcome. And um, if that blueprint was presented to me, um, maybe I would have taken a different path. Uh, but um, I'm very much pleased at the uh, success on the other blueprint that was provided to me on making sure that whatever I want to achieve, I can achieve. Uh, it may just have to work twice as hard, uh, but it is achievable. Yeah. That's yeah. good. I don't know. Excuse me. I don't know so much about uh, what else could have been, you know, uh, could have I uh, had more of a blueprint. Um, I think that um, more of it for me was just a matter of making sure that people gave me preparation. Prepare. Prepare yourself to be successful and do the things that you need to do to have an impact. Preparation. I think that's one of the things that my mom and dad always talked about was just make sure you prepare yourself so that when your moment comes, you're ready. So that's what I'm trying to do. I, I guess I echo that. I, I think, I don't think there's anything in this. I mean, you know, as far as having to work doubly hard, my teachers told me that. You know, you know, my parents told me things. I think they did everything they could possibly do to set, set me up for success. Uh, I just wish, uh, because they can't teach what they don't know, especially with them. Financial, we create yourself financially for life. I think I wish I would have had that conversation earlier on and, and, and uh, with my, my parents or some of my mentors. But everything else they gave to us, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I'm really proud of my parents did with so little. Uh, their message, and I think it's missing a lot in, in mentoring opportunities, is about love and kindness. I know Chief mentioned love and other people I mentioned love, but I can't, I think that's the foundation of positive relationships. And uh, I think I had it. I don't think my parents really knew how to talk about it. They lived that life. Um, I guess I wish they could have done more as far as having some really formal teaching sessions about love and kindness. It's so funny that, you know, I was raised in a church, but when I, when I learned about Buddhism, I learned this is what my parents have been teaching me my entire life. And it's all about love and kindness. I think just to to be authentic to who I am. I think uh, I spent a lot of time trying to please other people, fitting in. Uh, I made a lot of bad decisions as a young man because of that. Um, trying to find my place in the world and, and care a little less about the fitting in and, and more about who I am at, at my core. Um, that might have helped me along my way. Well, I got the blueprint. Um, I went to New Britain High School. I had a great track coach, a white man, who was uh, in New Britain High School, and God rest his soul, named Urban Black. New Britain High School went over 35 state championships. I didn't fill out one college application. I only ran track my senior year, and we won it uh, my senior year. And it's the second week of June, and, and Greg could echo this, and he called all the seniors in individually. We had the number two sprinter in the whole country who went on to the University of Houston. And there was eight of us that graduated, and these guys was all set. So when it came my time to go in his office, he said, Darwin, what do you want to do? And I said, 
I don't know. I, I'd like to go to college. He said, did you fill out an application? I said, coach, I didn't fill out one application. I didn't take no SAT, so-and-so. He said, hang on. He called a friend of his who was on the 1972 and 1976 Olympic team. They were managers together. And he said, I got this athlete that's not very talented, but he'll work hard. <laughs> and I'm sitting next to him, I'm like, is he talking to me? And next thing I know, he said, yeah, so-and-so, so-and-so. So he said, um, you're all set. He said, the application is going to come to me. I'm going to give it to you. You give it to your aunt, fill it out, so-and-so. And I was so grateful. Uh, and I thought I was going down to Central. At the time, it was CCSU. And I walked up the office, and the other guys that was lined up coming up after me said, um, man, so where are you going? I said, I, I think I'm going to Central. And they said, what do you mean you think? How do you not know? And everybody was afraid of Coach Black. He was a tough guy. So I was thinking, how do I go in there and say to him, Coach, where am I going without knowing? And I creeped back up the steps, and I said, uh, Coach, I, I just have to say this. I mean, I was listening, but I... I wasn't listening, and he said, uh, what's your question? I said, where am I going to? He said, oh, you're going down to Kentucky. <laughs> and at that time, I was like, I was even afraid to tell him, man, I got no money, how am I going to tell him I'm going to Kentucky? And before I could say that, he said, you're going to qualify. At the time, there was BEOG grants and all of this stuff. But to go back, he sent me to a guy named Dr. William Exum who was the first black football player at the University of Wisconsin in 1936. He taught me everything about dealing with, as he would say, because all my instructors was from Alabama, Mississippi, deep down south. And his first word when I got there was, he said, you don't know nothing about prejudice up there up north. And I looked at him, I was like, what does that mean? He said, we already know where we're at, where we stand. My job is to, pre to prepare you how to deal with the people up north. He said, you follow my lead, I'm going to send you back there to New Britain, Connecticut, and you are going to become successful. He asked me one question. He said, how many black teachers did you have coming up? And it was only like two in the district. And he said, you are going to be a black teacher, and I'm going to prepare you. Make a long story short, I followed this man's lead. And he told me this, and this is the story that always sticks with me. He said, nobody's going to care about what you did before. He said, one of my best friends did everything, everything for the country of the United States. And when he came back, they treated him like he didn't even go away. I said, who are you talking about, Doc? He said, Jesse Owens. He said, Jesse Owens went over to Germany and won four gold medals. They could care nothing about him. When he came back from Germany and went to Ohio State, and Ohio State uses him for all kinds of things, but they declared him ineligible to participate in track and field. You wouldn't know that story unless you read his book. And he said, so if you think they're going to care about Donald Shaw, if they didn't care about Jesse Owens, they really ain't going to care about you. And that man taught me more about life than, than I could even go over. Uh, I hate to share all of this, but it's all in my book. I hate to be up here like with these other guys. <laughs> He's up there selling his book, but my whole life is in there. And that one guy, just because that mentor I had from New Britain High School sent me to him, my whole life got directed by him. And my job now is to direct others in the same way. Thank you, Mr. Chef. OK, we're running out of time. Uh, let's bring it back home. At Tungsus Community College, what are you doing about my brother's key, Elias? That's the question. What are you doing at Tungsus Community College about my brother's keeper, Elias? That is the question. Don't answer. <laughs> You've been given the blueprint. This is the blueprint. Something has to happen. Our future depends on it. It's important. The young people who are sitting here right now 
are depending on it. Because I'm, uh, so got that music thing in my back and I can't get it off. I want you to take a look and listen at something. It's important that each and every one of us do something. You've got to do something. You need to network. There are experts right here. How can you get a hold of them? In your program. This is the most valuable item that we have today. On behalf of your, the school, we'd like to thank you so much for bringing that knowledge. Come back again. Thank all of you and have a great day.